ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first episode of the Comics Inc. podcast here on BRB. I am Ruben, your host, and I am joined by my co-host Rick. Hello. And Ryan. Hello. Hi there, guys. Uh, so this is the first episode. We're very excited to be bringing you some comics content for BRB. We're going to go through some stuff in the news and what we've been reading. So hopefully you guys uh, enjoy the show. Starting with the news topics, this one is a little bit sad to get us started, but we figured we should get it kind of over and done with before it gets too long. Steve Ditko died recently. Uh, you may not be necessarily familiar with Steve Ditko, because as we'll discuss, he wasn't the best self-promoter, but you definitely know his work. He was one of the kind of original Marvel Comics artists, so he worked a lot with Stan Lee. He's the co-creator of Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, for the original kind of looks of both of those characters are directly down to him. Well, he was one of the Godfathers, wasn't he? It's like when Kirby died. It's weird to think that the simultaneously comics, superhero comics, at least as we know them, are a thing that really only has existed in living memory, but increasingly not anymore. How do you mean? Well, just in the sense that people like Stan Lee and, and until recently Steve Ditko were, were still alive. Yeah. But they're kind of reaching the point where they're not, because they were all, as we were saying before, they were all adults when they invented the concept of superheroes, more or less. You know, they were already adults in their 30s with careers, and now, decades later, is actually everything that's kind of sprung from that. And with comics, a lot of characters in that coming from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, like as we know them. Yeah, the creators and stuff are getting on in years, aren't they? And it's, it's going to happen, but it, it's... It's weird because when you think about comics, really, like the names that come to mind now are people like Brian Michael Bendis, Jim Lee, you know, a lot of the, the I don't want to say the new guard, but a lot of the younger names. And then you kind of think that people like Stan Lee and Ditko are like, they're going to live forever. And then you realise that they're both in their 90s. Yeah, it's kind of inevitable at this point that we're going to kind of start losing those pieces it, it's it kind of sucks but it's also i mean age 90 is not you know it's not like this was it's not a bad age to go yeah it's exactly and and he left behind a pretty impressive body of work considering really and it's nice that we finally got to see a kind of riff on his design in a movie yeah that is also true yeah with uh, the spider-man homecoming costume like with the eyes and the web wings. The the parts of it that... It, uh, the web wings... The, sorry, the eyes and the web wings are, are parts of the design that I'm really surprised no one put in before. I guess there were technical limitations, but the first time you see the moving eye slits in the costume in, I think it's Civil War is the first time they do that? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. It was, you know, it was a real thing of like, oh yeah, that's actually what Spider-Man looks like. Yeah, and they did it in such a good way as well. I think it was Deadpool that kind of showed that they can animate eyes, and then they just used technology to talk the way around it for Civil War and the design of Spider-Man. Yeah, exactly. And I think it it worked really well, actually. I mean, the design of Spider-Man is something that was like, obviously Steve Ditko was the first person to draw him, but there's the story, isn't there, about how when Stan Lee came up with the idea, he went to Jack Kirby and Jack Kirby did... I, I presume a Jack Kirby drawing. Yeah. A, a man who is about half as wide as he was <laughs> tall, wearing some elaborate, like, 60s psychedelic outfit, and then that wasn't quite what they were looking for. And they ended up coming up with the, the kind of teenage Peter Parker thing, which uh, is pretty one of the more endearing and uh, enduring kind of character designs in comics, I think. It's probably up there with, like, Batman, in terms of, like, uh, a whole aesthetic that's pretty much survived unchanged. Yeah, Superman, all the big ones. It's the use of colours, and they're so bold and simple. That it's just such a good design, and whenever they change the design, there's always an outcry to bring it back. That's the sign of a good design, not just for comic characters, but for like everything in general. When the original is always going to win. Yeah, exactly. It's there's kind of a, a impressive level of design, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those interesting things. If we're talking about Homecoming, there's clear. I mean, like there are in a lot of comic book movies, wholesale kind of images lifted from panels in Ditko's yeah. books. There's a particular moment in Homecoming, that's the one of the more famous ones, when Spider-Man's buried under the pile of rubble and he lifts himself up, and the water's dripping down, and yeah, that that one. You probably know what it is if you search for that section of the movie if you've seen it and also the panels from that same uh, Spider-Man story it's not I don't think it's obviously not the same story as Homecoming because I think he's battling Doctor Octopus in that one but it's that kind of design and that kind of the images that they're just putting into things yeah now. it's uh, it's a proper good hat tip yeah exactly the, the whole image still is pretty indicative of the character which again is testament to how well that things were set up in 19, 1962 was it that they the Spider-Man came out August 1962 yeah and also the, the other the famous character he was pretty uh uh, integral to the creation of was Doctor Strange as well, which again, we're seeing that in the movies and in the books now, the designs of the kind of weird 60s inspired, I think I said psychedelic before, but I think that's kind of what it was drawing on at the very least. For Doctor Strange, definitely anyway, yeah, because obviously they're very different characters, it's Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, and a more psychedelic look matches more with Doctor Strange's sort of 
mythos. I think the psychedelia in Doctor Strange and Thor Ragnarok as well, that was more the Kirby-inspired stuff, though. Yeah, it's definitely, like, kind of the basis for it, but I think I think it's, like, the it was the kind of aesthetic of the decade anyway. But it's definitely the fact that Ditko's range stretched between Doctor Strange all the way over to Spider-Man, because, I mean, Jack Kirby's drawings are amazing and his, like, work is really, really great, but you can never look at it and go, like, that's not Jack Kirby. You always know exactly what you're getting. He was very good at, uh, like, one particular style, which was his style, and he was kind of magnificent at it but i don't think if jack kirby had drawn spider-man he would have the same kind of universal appeal he'd, he'd probably have a cape and like space webs or something pretty sure that's happened at some point <laughs> oh i mean it definitely has happened since but you know for, for, I, wanna, I was gonna say for better or for worse but it's 100 percent for worse <laughs> there were some dark times in comic books <laughs> yes we don't speak of the space the space webs but yeah jack kirby is kind of a, a, an interesting person like he was quite he was well, quite he was very private i think that the last interview he did was sometime in the 60s or 70s like he didn't want to talk to the press he didn't want to do any kind of extra publicity stuff whereas someone like stan lee has pretty much turned everything in the last sort of 40 50 years of his career into look at me i'm stan lee yeah look at me say excelsior kind of thing look at look at me do cameos in movies <laughs> yeah exactly yeah you'd never i don't think steve Ditko would ever have wanted to have been in a cameo in in spider-man homecoming if they'd offered it to him, you know. Well, that's but... the thing. Stan Lee was very good at turning himself into a brand. Yeah, well, it's, there's definitely something to be said for that, and it's. I guess it's it's like the um, Bob Kane, Bill Finger thing for Batman, isn't it? That's a, another story that's kind of not not similar in the sense of stealing credit necessarily, but just in terms of one person was a much better showman than the other, and that's the name that is still attached to things. And that's one of the good things that Batman vs. Superman did. They credited Bill Finger as the co-creator of Batman, which I think was the first movie to actually do that. I think it was. I think there was there was an issue there about kind of the technical side, like legal side. They couldn't thank him or something, because that would be implying that he had some responsibility that he legally supposedly didn't have. So it was a thing of they actually couldn't do anything about it. Not that, you know, before Batman vs Superman, anyone was inclined to really deep dive on the, the nerdy side of comic books anyway. If I remember rightly, there was some, I think it was some weird thing with, with uh, Bill Finger's like a state or something in terms of who was managing his assets or something. It was something to do with whether he should get credit or not. And I think there were people saying, no, he shouldn't get any credit. And then I think when things moved around, it finally came out that he should get it. And then, yeah, Batman and Superman finally credited him. It's just a shame it wasn't in a good movie. <laughs> Hey, I'll, I'll maintain that I don't mind that movie. <laughs> I like that your defence for it not being a good movie is I, I don't mind that movie. It's okay, it's okay. It's it's no Batman Begins or Dark Knight, is it? But It's not even The Phantom. <laughs> That's too well, yeah. <laughs> Let's be careful, this is, like, this is the first episode we'd want it to end on a note because we get into an argument about whether or not DC movies are acceptable. That's it, everyone. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for listening to Comic Sync. This has been Brief. Suicide Squad. Good movie. Film of the year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Suicide Squad, there is a good movie trapped inside the thing that was in cinemas. There has to be somewhere, some, some, there was some good stuff. Every bit with Will Smith in it was good. I think it's a dumb film that I enjoy, but we're getting off topic. We are a little bit, yes. <laughs> uh... But sticking with the screen. I like that. Look at that little segue to the next story that was. I like that a lot, thanks. They were good, wasn't it? So yes, uh, speaking of things on screen, just the past couple of days, Marvel has released a trailer for the new animated miniseries, Marvel Rising Initiation. So it's a collaboration between Marvel Animation and Disney XD. So it's going to be a new series of animated shorts centering on the character of Gwen Stacy. Um, she's known in the comics, I think, as Spider Gwen. Yes, she is. But the character they're using is Ghost Spider is the name they're going for. I don't know quite. I guess so as to not confuse why is she called Spider Gwen if a bunch of new viewers aren't going to understand the whole Gwen Stacy history thing, which there's no reason that they should do, really. That was a very old storyline. Well, they can't really call her spider gwen that's just like the nickname in the comics people don't go oh look there goes spider gwen that's true actually <laughs> so i think ghost spider you know it's it's cool that's true i hadn't it uh, as stupid as i am it hadn't occurred to me that that couldn't possibly be her <laughs> in fiction superhero name it would be very much like you know giving things away wouldn't it <laughs> yeah exactly it's yeah, it'd be like having like Bat Wayne Man. Like Superman being called Super Clark. Yeah, Super Super Kent. Oh god, yeah. Got to be careful how you say that though. <laughs> <laughs> this is a PG show. Yeah, so it's also featuring some of the the newer Marvel roster characters like Kamala Khan, so Miss Marvel, Squirrel Girl, 
Patriot as well, which is not a character I'm super familiar with, but I think kind of in a Captain America vein. Uh, and Quake, who is the carryover character from the Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV series. Yep. Played by the same actress, Chloe Bennett, who plays Daisy Johnson slash Quake in the, in the Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV series, is also doing the voice acting for this particular show. It's a good shout for her. Is this going to be in the same universe as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? which would then put it in the same universe as the MCU by proxy? Or is it just a little Easter egg that it's Chloe Bennett voicing Quake? Because Dove Cameron, who's Gwen Stacy, I'm pretty sure is the villain in the last series of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I mean, I I got to imagine it isn't going to link to the movies, because if it was, we'd have heard like a 100,000 things about this already, because there's no way they'd keep that quiet. But in the same way, this to me, especially with the the focus on female characters, it's hitting me a little bit like the Star Wars Forces of Destiny, little videos that focus on different characters in different timelines, but everything's canon. It's just interesting little stories that were made to sell toys but they are canon stories. That's interesting. I mean, I'm not I'm not overly familiar with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I watched the first couple of seasons, but I know they're on quite a few kind of deep now. But the character of Quake, they're obviously retconning the version, because presumably it's not the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. version they're going for. It's the current version. Team the agent thing. But what's interesting is the version in Marvel Rising is comic accurate. She looks how she does in the books, but the only thing that Chloe Bennett has in common with her character is the gauntlets okay i mean i guess it's probably it's probably the reverse because i mean weirdly of the the four heroes five heroes that are in this show supposedly the most recognizable one probably is quake then because although uh, squirrel girl and uh, ms marvel are pretty big deals kind of in the comics world none of them have made any kind of impression they're new enough that they've never been involved in any of the marvel mainstream tv series i don't think certainly none of the movies before or the mcu movies at all so it's probably quite a good hook to get people who've watched a TV series to tune in because they go, oh, I know that character. That one actually has some name recognition. I think Spider-Gwen would be the most, or Spider-Ghost or whatever she's called, would be the most recognisable one. Ghost Spider. Because when the Spider-Gwen miniseries came out, there was such a buzz about it. And she has such a cool design that I know people that don't read comics who know who she is. And the fact that she's had the Gwenpool spin-off and that you know they're doing stuff with that character now she's becoming much more of a name oh she's definitely a name but i think in terms of again maybe is the most famous one and compared to comics which are a relatively as much as we love them a relatively limited outlet compared to the tv series and the movies and things i just wonder if obviously the design is pretty you know it's on its way to becoming iconic already and just the the spider prefix or suffix to any kind of superhero name is enough to get kind of people to go and pay attention but given that it's coming out on the the Disney Kids channel. I wonder if it's more just an extra name and someone that they've already kind of introduced. Just because it's coming out on Disney XD. Don't write it off. Star Wars Rebels, Disney XD, one of the best things on TV. No, no, I'm not. I will fight anyone. (laughs) (laughs) You're very defensive over Disney XD. We've found Rick's Batman vs. Superman. It's the Disney XD channel. That's because Disney send me checks for the nice things I say about Star Wars. Oh, do they? Can can some of us? Because I'll say nice things about Disney if they pay me. No, you've got to say that The Last Jedi was the best film ever made. Oh, yeah, it is. There you go. That's not not controversial. Don't say that. (laughs) People will call you a soy boy. (laughs) Oh, God, that is some context that this, this, as you said, PG podcast really does not need. (laughs) (laughs) You really fight on the line there. Yeah, so the, this TV series is, uh, it turns out, kind of part of a spin off of Marvel Rising, which is a, a comic series that they already have. So it's obviously just uh, another wave, and it is only a, a sort of a range of shorts. They're not a full on 22 episode, 20 minute long TV series, which is a bit of a shame, I think, but hopefully this is just like a testing ground for those characters. That's why I think it's going to be like Forces of Destiny. Or do you remember the old. Clone Wars cartoon that was by the Samurai Jack people. I vaguely remember it. I can't say I've ever watched a ton of it, but the art style, now you say it's Samurai Jack, I do remember that, yeah. They were only short five minute episodes that were spread out over a while. There was two seasons of it and put them together and they're like two hours long, but they were only little five minute episodes. It's interesting because it must be down to the art style, just the content that I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan, but the memories I have of those those shows I remember them being quite long, like considerable episodes, but obviously that's just my memory playing tricks on me. 
So there's also supposedly a Marvel Rising colon Secret Warriors film, which I presume is an animated film coming out later this year as well. So they're obviously trying to build kind of a, a another brand, I suppose, you know, in the same way that they've had things like Marvel Knights before. Yeah. They're obviously trying to just spread things out and build new initiatives, which, to be honest with you, I, I'm completely fine with, especially when they're bringing out characters like Miss Marvel and Squirrel Girl, who are two, at least I, I think they're very good characters and very funny and light-hearted, which makes a real nice change from a lot of stuff that we get in comic books where things can dip too far into a little grim dark, shall we say. It's also going to be good for the movies, because with everything changing after Avengers 4, they're going to be looking at new characters to introduce. So if these characters get a good reaction, there's a chance that we'll get to see them on the big screen. You never know. Avengers 4, you know, it hasn't come out yet. There is always the chance, canonically, Squirrel Girl has defeated Thanos. So maybe that's how they save the day. I think canonically everyone's had a go, haven't they? <laughs> everyone's beat him at least once. Ain't that impressive? But I mean, you know, she beat him with the power of squirrels, which is better than, more considerable than, oh, giant lasers or Hulk smashing. Or the power of spiders. I mean, Spider-Man never has that many spider-related powers. He just jumps around a lot more than anything. <laughs> yeah, he's he's agile, but spiders don't jump very much. We, you know what? We shouldn't pull at this sweater or the whole universe of this fandom could unravel. And we don't Have you that. ever seen Spider-Man getting out of a bath? I've not. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. It's a good thought. It's a good thought, though. Yeah, yeah. I haven't ever seen him get out of the bath, but I mean, my exposure to Spider-Man is relatively limited to the times when he's adventuring. I don't follow him around. Although there probably is something to be said for that. Imagine if he got trapped under a massive glass. Oh, that's definitely have to have happened at some point. There must be a comic of him getting like miniaturized or something, and then running along a table, and then someone making a giant glass or a giant glass, but and dropping it on him mousetrap style. Yeah, that's absolutely what they did. I'm sure because I mean, I'm pretty sure the cover of Amazing Fantasy where he debuted is the one where he's with the Fantastic Four where he's trapped in a large glass. Oh, it's not Amazing Fantasy, that's the kind of web-swinging one, but there's definitely one of his debut issues with the Fantastic Four, where he's caught in a large glass container, so clearly... You're, yeah, you're not wrong. The Amazing Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four think I'm trapped, but they don't suspect my real power, and there he is, trapped in what looks like a giant glass. Yeah, there you go, see? They, they thought he was a spider, and so they trapped him in a giant glass, but little did they know, he was also a man. And therefore, can lift glasses with his opposable thumbs. Yeah, exactly. I'm more looking forward to the scene where they slide the paper underneath the glass <laughs> and carrying him to the window. That and then he just swings back in and like, knocks them all out. Have you seen those spider grabbers that you can get now? Oh, well, they're the little kind of thing on a stick. You slide it over the top. So someone getting him with one of them. So like, what are you doing? There's tickles. It's like, get off. Get out of my house. That's definitely that had to have happened at some point. Like Mysterio or someone's had to build something like that. Maybe we've spoiled the next Spider-Man movie. Maybe... People from Marvel are going to hear this and go, oh, for God's sake, the whole arc, <laughs> the whole third act has just been ruined. I'm not saying that we did predict the future, but if it turns out that we have, it was totally on purpose. And I am actually Tom Holland. <laughs> <laughs> just finding new ways to spoil the movie. I'm just going to email you the script. F*** it. Ooh. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, make sure just to, to tag in. I said a swear. You did. This is a PG show. We're not PG anymore. Oh, no, no. it's it. happened. What that's have we it. done? Oh, the walls have come crumbling down. <laughs> it's fine. I I feel like there's a reasonably decent chance and no one heard it because it was edited out. Excellent. So we're off the hook for now. Thanks for that. We'll move swiftly onwards. So this one, Rick, I will let you uh, take the lead on because you have seen Ant-Man and the Wasp. Yeah, I have. I went to America for a few weeks and while I was over there, Ant-Man and the Wasp was released at the cinemas. So... I got to see it a month before you guys did, because Americans don't care about the World Cup, <laughs> and what does it matter? It didn't come home anyway, so more fool you, England. I win. Or, if you think about it, hasn't it always really been home? Oh, that's not good. No, please. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think the real question is, do you really care? No, not at all. <laughs> Then let's talk about Ant-Man and the Wasp. Yes, please. All right, did you like the first one? Yes, I did. Uh, I watched it again recently in preparation for seeing the sequel. I think that the sequel is on par, if not better, than the first one. Do I need to have seen the first one to get the second one? Because I've not seen the first 100%. one. 100%. Okay, good. Yeah, it's like a it's a proper sequel. Like You need to have known what's going on. And also, watch Civil War. That I've done, so we're all good. Yeah, Ant-Man and Civil War, and then this one, and you're golden. Good to know. I don't want to go into the plot because the trailers are completely misleading. 
Oh, okay. Interesting. I mean, I, I've not watched most of the trailers. I've seen you know, bits and pieces, but they're just entirely kind of red herring. Marvel are getting very good at showing you a trailer, but changing things in the trailer. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, they did that with um, Infinity War, didn't they? There's a whole like scene of people running that's not in the film. And they edited out the Infinity Stones from the Gauntlet and oh, yes, they all did, this yeah. stuff. But they also use a lot of cut dialogue. So it makes it sound like one thing when you watch the film and it's actually something else. Oh, okay. It's great. The dynamic between Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly is great. Do they give, do they actually, I know her, like obviously the, the title of The Wasp is in the title of the film, but do they actually give Evangeline Lilly things to do in this movie? I think the film should be called The Wasp featuring Ant-Man. Good. That is what I like to hear. Because re-watching um, Ant-Man recently, I realised like Evangeline Lilly is probably the most compelling character in that whole film and most of the screen time she gets seems to be during Paul Rudd's training sequence and it's like, come on guys. Yeah, it's called Ant-Man and the Wasp for a reason. She has a lot to do and she's in charge. Good. And he's he's just Ant-Man but she's been training her whole life and now she's got a suit. That was sort of the joke of the whole Ant-Man movie, isn't it? That he's not, you know, he's not the elite warrior of destiny. He's just a guy who's a bit good at stealing but like only a bit. Yeah. It's really funny. It's it's a lot more sure of itself this time, because the first one was such a mess. I mean, it, it worked out well, but everything behind the scenes was such a mess, like with Edgar Wright leaving and then the script being rewritten, and yeah, you know how much of the script was Edgar Wright's, how much was everyone else's. This is just theirs, and because it's sure of what it is, it works really well. I enjoyed the villain. It's not a oh, destroy the world story. It's a very small and contained story about Ant-Man and the Wasp. Much like the first one was a small contained story about those characters. This is also small and contained. And it works so well for those characters. Because they don't need to save the world. They're very little. Or one of them can go big. <laughs> that's. I mean, that's kind of the the... The whole like good thing that you get a lot from the comic books that I think sometimes the movies miss is the sense of like sliding scale, like all the way up to Infinity War, going across planets and saving the world and doing everything. But actually, it's nice sometimes to just have a, a pretty low stakes kind of personal thing. That's why I thought Winter Soldier was so good. Yeah, exactly. The, the stakes are always more engaging when they're actually personal. Like obviously in Winter Soldier, it's, you know, evil terrorists are going to like shoot people from the sky. But honestly, like mostly you just want to see Captain America get to hug his like best friend slash you know life partner. Yeah, it was the personal story that made that film what it was. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same with Iron Man. It's what made Iron Man so great. That wasn't a story about world domination. It was a story about a bold bloke with a beard wanting to get richer. <laughs> the dynamic between those two and that story was really good. And then when it expands, you're like, oh, this is getting a bit silly. But I think what the Russos have done really well with their films is they started off with Winter Soldier, and then Civil War was a bit bigger. That's true. I always forget they did that. And then in, and Infinity War, considerably bigger. Even when you look at the stories or like the um, the villains' reasoning for doing stuff in those films, yeah, it's very personal. Zemo isn't trying to destroy the world. He's just trying to get them to tear themselves apart because his family died and even thanos thinks he's doing the right thing he's not trying to take over the universe (laughs) no he's trying to save it yeah and it's very yeah and ant-man and the wasp back on topic has one of those kind of stories the the story revolves around families a lot it's like the fast and the furious (laughs) No, that's good. I mean, I think that's definitely uh, a nice palate cleanser, at least, considering that Infinity War was the last Marvel movie we got. That was pretty heavy, pretty full-on, pretty, you know, got a dammerung and all the rest of it. Like, it's nice to have something where you can actually stop and go, no, this is just about some people trying to help out some people that they care about, and hopefully they'll succeed. And then the after credit scene happens and you realise that, oh, this is linked into Infinity War. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I mean, I was always going to stay for that. Not going to tell you what happens, but if you've been wondering how it segues into Infinity War, they do it. Oh, okay. That's the one we're staying for. The after credit sequence at the end of the credits, not really worth it. No. Okay. And you see that one in the trailer. 
Oh, so a, keep your eye weird... on the trailers. See if you can guess which one the after credit sequence is. That's a really weird way of doing it. Then you win a prize. But I guess it's like like Rick was saying a minute ago that if you have things out of order and in different pieces, you don't know what you've got until you're already on top of it. True. Yeah, yeah true. So yeah, I think four barrels out of five. And five out of five for consistent branding as well. Yeah, I'm I'm a professional. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, um, yeah, it's an excellent uh, like recommendation. I mean, I was always going to go and see it because I'm that person. I think we're all really that person. But uh, yeah, good. It's good to know that I've got something to look forward to. Yeah, I'll be seeing it again when it's out over here. Excellent. Uh, so speaking of things that we've we've seen and enjoyed uh, recently, we've all been reading some different uh, comic books because comic books are good. Would anyone like to start with anything they've been reading recently? Well, I've been talking loads. Ryan hasn't said a word yet, so... Oh, how rude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'll go first then. So I've been reading All-Star Batman, My Own Worst Enemy. So it's trade print number one from the post craziness um happening uh scott snyder and i think it was greg capullo i can't really fully remember at this point but scott snyder obviously very involved in court of owls and a few different different stories so he's obviously got a very good pedigree at the moment with batman so when they change things around he wanted to do something a little bit different and the first time i saw i actually had this in single issues so i've read it as a single issue to instead of the trade print because i've got a little subscription so i get all the comics the first time you get the comic, it's not a traditional sort of, I know it's going to sound weird, thin comic. It's its cover is a little bit thicker, it's got a few more pages, and you can tell a lot more effort's gone into it, if that makes more sense in terms of the design concepts. Yeah, it's a premium kind of thing. Yeah, and it's pretty damn fantastic. Obviously, he, he knows how to write that much sort of tell a good Batman story at this point and it's so we've talked about six or seven issues and it is a story of Batman traveling with Two-Face around about 800 miles or something like that across different areas and bounty hunters and assassins are trying to hunt them down uh obviously I'm not going to go into the plot details too much in terms of why they're trying to hunt him down or hunt them both down but batman at the end of the day he, he's still harvey he's his friend so two-face is still his friend at the core concept of it they touch a little bit on their previous relationship and they touch a little bit on on bruce as well and it's really dark and gritty and that's what i like from my comics i want serious topics and there's a lot of blood and gore and characters popping up that you don't expect to pop up every so often and they're just there they have a good few pages and then they're gone again which is just so it's, it brings in quite a lot especially because batman's got so many assassins in his in his rogues of course yeah it's gallery that people can just turn up and it's a brilliant read that they both know what they're doing i see scott and greg and they, it's just it's such a good story and once you get past that and you start getting to the, the next story arc, that's even, that's just as good. But each sort of issue or each little mini arc within it, the, the, there's a good story within each sort of issue. And it's just it's just really good. It's just a good Batman story at the end of the day. I definitely want to check it out. I mean, I love all of Scott Snyder's, his run that he did for the, the new 52 reboot, like you said, The Court of Owls and all that stuff with Greg Capullo um, is one of my favourite kind of comic book like overall stories like it's a few years worth of trades which if nothing else if you want to go out and read some of the best batman stories ever it's the court of owls and i think the city of owls are volumes volumes one one and two two. yeah Yeah, which are amazing um and i'm also a really big sucker for like a road trip like a road trip kind of action thing especially when the two people on the road trip are the good guy and the good guy's nemesis don't know why that's just a thing when it's in movies or comic books or anything it's just like yep that's that's me sold on the whole premise yeah there's there's quite like nice shots towards the end of each sort of issue and it's like you know 500 miles to go and you know something massive just happened it's like oh okay flipping out there's still (laughs) there's still so much to happen yeah it's like a long distance it's hard to go okay cool so that's batman all-star batman yeah not my own worst enemy which is not to be confused with the frank miller jim lee all-star batman which is its own different thing that we'll touch on another time, I think. Yes, <laughs> I mean, DC love reusing their names. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if they've got brand, you got brand recognition, I think if you stick the word Batman in front of anything... You know, yeah, you know it's going to be successful. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so speaking of uh, things that have kind of instant brand name recognition, Rick, you've been, you've been reading Darth Maul? Yeah, Darth Maul, written by Colin Bunn, Luke Ross did the art for it, 
Nolan Woodard coloured it. It's a lot of fun. It is a prequel story about Darth Maul, obviously. It takes place before The Phantom Menace, before the Sith have revealed themselves to the Jedi. Darth Maul's getting bored. He's training, but he's being told to wait. He's got all this anger, all this rage, all this stuff pent up inside of him, and he can't get it out. So he goes on the hunt, and it opens up with him hunting a pack of Rathtars. Do you remember those big tentacly things from The Force Awakens in Han Solo's ship? Very nice, yeah. He's hunting those, but he needs a bigger game. So he goes on the hunt to track down a young Jedi Padawan that's been captured. In order to do that, he enlists the help of Cad Bane. So if you watch The Clone Wars, the CG animated one that's canon, Cad Bane is the bounty hunter with the big brimmed hat, the blue face, the tubes, and in big red eyes. And Aura Singh, who is, or well, was, part of Boba Fett's Clone Wars crew, she actually gets a name mention in the Solo movie, and it's Beckett, um, Woody Harrelson's character, mentions that he killed her. So that was a, a cool little tie-in. Okay. And they're the bounty hunters that he enlists to track down, then infiltrate and capture the Padawan. I won't tell you how they do it, how it ends. But it's a great, great little story. It kind of feels like... Do you remember there was that Darth Maul fan film that came out a few years ago of Darth Maul on this wooded planet and then some Jedis come down and he ends up taking them out? It kind of feels like Disney saw it and Lucas saw it and were like, okay, we'll do something like that. And it's it's a really good sort of character piece for Darth Maul because a lot of it's from the first person, like he's in a monologue and you just get all his anger and his frustration and all this stuff and you can really see where he's coming from and there's nods to Rebels, there's nods to the Clone Wars and there's a lot of foreshadowing in it and it's seeing how Rebels, end. well seeing as how Darth Maul ends in Star Wars Rebels and then seeing where he begins in this there's a nice little line up to it and it's just a great book if you're a Star Wars fan if you're enjoying the new canon definitely one to pick up they did a great job with um, Son of Dathomir as well but that was an unused Clone Wars episode but this as far as I'm aware completely original story sets up some pre-Phantom Menace Darth Maul you get to see him be just this predator you get to see Maul be the Predator, which you don't get quite a lot. Which is pretty cool, because, I mean, Darth Maul is, like, he's got to be in the top ten of characters that look amazing. I mean, top ten, <laughs> top five Star Wars characters that look amazing and do really cool stuff for the three minutes they're on screen, but get <laughs> no characterization, no inner monologue. Like, I don't know anything about Darth Maul. He's got a two, like, bladed red lightsaber, and he does lots of flips, and that's everything I know about Darth Maul from that movie. It's the biggest problem with that character, and it's why personally as a big star wars fan i think star wars is at its best when george lucas is only in the shadows mm. because what they did with maul in clone wars was again they took ideas of how to bring him back from the expanded universe okay i didn't even realize he'd survived i, I was in the impression that he met his end from uh young ewan mcgregor darth maul becomes one of the most important characters in the clone wars because Dave Filoni is an absolute genius, brings him back. Because the the argument is, he was only cut in the midriff, he had his legs cut off. I mean, you say only. I feel yeah, like but if that out of all the me... vital organs to lose, you can live without your dick. <laughs> <laughs> and let's be fair, when you get your power from being really angry, you're going to be pissed at the man that cut your dick off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that power's is... going to keep you alive. And That's it a does. very true fact, yeah. Yeah, and... <laughs> He ends up forging some like messed up scorpion body for himself on this trash planet. Then his brother finds him, and the Night Sisters of Dathomir fix him. He goes on the rampage to try and get Kenobi's attention because the only thing that's kept him alive is his hatred for Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> and he's like, "I just want to kill you." So, and he ends up drawing him out. He ends up becoming the leader of this criminal syndicate like he brings all these criminal families together and takes over and it's not until he becomes this big like underworld threat that Darth Sidious notices him again but because he's already got an apprentice he takes him out or at least tries to 
and then he escapes, loses everything, disappears for a few years, ends up on a planet called Malachor in his later years. This is when he meets Ezra and the the crew from the Ghost in Rebels becomes a mainstay in the Rebel series until he gets defeated by Obi-Wan Kenobi in one of the coolest lightsaber battles in Star Wars history. Hmm. It's literally like two samurai going for it, and they just run at each other, and then all falls to the floor. Nice. And as he he dies in Kenobi's arms, but there's no hatred, there's no anger, there's just two old men who have been forsaken by the religions that they once believed in, and you know there's a real peace there, and it's awesome the fact that they managed to get this character who just looked badass and managed to give him life a backstory to actually chew on almost yeah and they ended up making him one of the best characters in star wars i mean everything i every time i hear about the star wars extended universe particularly the that is it the clone wars that was the the big tv series and um the comic books that they're doing in the moment i feel like it some people are talking about an entirely different franchise to the films that i've seen because I, I loved I love, especially in the newest ones, Force Awakens and Last Jedi in particular was absolutely fantastic. But it's sometimes when you talk about, yeah, like two old men forsaken by the religions that they once like worshipped. It's like, what if it, like, that's not the same show that I watched. Like, that's not the movie that I saw. It's like, the movies are good, but that's something entirely different. I've been doing a lot of soul searching and stuff as far as my love for Star Wars. And the reason that I love it as much as I do is because of the expanded stuff. I love the movies. I love the movies. Like, A New Hope's great. Empire and Jedi, fantastic. The prequels are the prequels. Just, you know, they have the good points. Like, without the prequels, we wouldn't have had Darth Maul. Hmm, that is true. That is Um, true. Without Attack of the Clones, we wouldn't have had the Clone Wars series. And without Revenge of the Sith, we wouldn't have seen Hayden Christensen writhing around in pain in a volcano. (laughs) I mean... Again, that, that is, you know, that's not inaccurate. That was cruel. <laughs> I take that back because I've, I've actually got a lot of love for that guy. He he had a very difficult job and he did the best he could with the director that he had. The issue is fair to say that Hayden Christensen delivers a solid performance given what he is given. Considering that in one of the movies he has, it says that he doesn't like sand. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Don't get me wrong. I'm fully on board with the no sand policy. Yeah. But... It's not a it's not a great look, is it? It's not <laughs> Yeah, like I don't like sand, but I'd never use it as a chat up line. <laughs> because the last thing that a girl wants to think about if you're trying to get in the pants is sand. That's true. It's probably one of the things that right, this person's gonna be one of the most powerful people in the universe. His big weakness, sand. That's like like Bruce Willis and Unbreakable, isn't it? What's his weakness? Water. Ooh. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I mean, actually, Darth Vader's weakness is probably still sand because if he gets it in his like breathing filters, that's, that's going to mess actually, him up. You don't uh, want you don't want sand in your circuits. So, actually, I, I suppose it makes sense. It's canonical. And speaking of Darth Vader, I am going to make a recommendation to you, Ruben. Read Kieran Gillen's Darth Vader run. Okay. It is phenomenal. Do you know that people keep saying, you know in Rogue One that you see Darth Vader in that corridor for that one scene? Yeah, yeah. And everyone's like, holy shit, that's the Darth Vader I've wanted to see since I was a kid. We need to get a film. This needs to be a film. We need a Darth Vader movie. The Darth Vader comics is that film. I've read the first print, uh, the like the first TP, and it and it is it's really good. Like Darth Vader comics is real good. Okay, yeah, if it, if it's anything like that one bit in that 30 second bit of Rogue One, which was the best bit of Rogue One, then I'm I'm on board. Yeah. That's the Kieran Gillen one. I like Kieran Gillen's work anyway. They, they, they paint him as a they paint him as a massive badass. Yeah, I mean I that's the thing. Expect. It's funny cuz watching not that this is the Star Wars podcast, but it's funny watching the old movies because he definitely uh is just like a man in a suit that he can't see out of walking very slowly. Yeah. So it's nice to see him do some some cool some cool badass stuff so yeah i was reading darth maul definite recommendation again it's filling out some canon that i would actually be interested to read so uh, for my thing i've been reading a book uh so i've had quite a lot of image comics that i wanted to read and i've had sat on my hard drive tormenting me uh so i finally started to crack into them and i started reading a book called rat queens are either of you two familiar with rat queens i am not i'm not no 
I suppose the best way to, to summarize this, have either of you two of you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Yes. No, but I've wanted to. Okay, well, Rat Queens, it's not literally the story of an adventure, like someone's autobiographical adventuring party, but it's basically, if you have ever played D&D or any kind of uh, tabletop RPG, this is pretty much what that is. It's the story of these four these four women, these four uh, kind of medieval fantasy hero adventurers. That they, The group is called the Rat Queens. Uh, and it is like they are just destructive and ruthless and they spend all their time getting drunk and having sex with what would amount to the NPCs in the game that they're involved in. Um, so the first the first trade is called Sass and Sorcery, which is the book I've been reading. Um, and it's about the four of them. It opens with the four of them in prison because they got into a bar fight with a group of other adventurers that leveled half the town. And so they've been basically banned from the city that they live in because they're too expensive to keep like uh, hanging around. <laughs> uh, and it's it's really great. Like it's really hilariously funny. Like if you if you play D anD D, then you'll definitely like get a lot of the jokes in it. But if you're just familiar with kind of like fantasy and also just generally like funny things, and um, there's a lot of it is it's not really a kids thing. It's a lot of quite graphic violence and there's a lot of really creative swearing. I'm getting Tank Girl vibes from what you're saying. It probably I'm not hugely familiar with Tank Girl, but there is definitely I think a bit of that. There is, uh, yeah, it's just kind of crazy and anarchic and not like to the sense that it's completely directionless. But the four characters are kind of just uh, kind of turned loose on the world and permitted to do whatever they kind of want to do, and they keep getting in fights with people. Uh, and there is there is a pretty decent story. Like it opens. Uh, not exactly in media res with the four of them in prison, but you definitely get a sense that these are characters who've existed in their world for a long time. And although it gives you some backstory, um, in like in the first issue, you get hints of where everyone's kind of come from, what their kind of powers are, where they come, what like what they can do. Um, but also like the relationships they built up. Um, so one of uh, one of the queens is uh, dealing with the fact that her her ex boyfriend is captain of the guard in this town, and they kind of have a fractured relationship because it doesn't dwell on why they broke up, but just the fact that their relationship ended. But they still have to see each other. Uh, and then one of the other ones uh, is kind of dealing with the fact that this this girl that she likes doesn't want to be in a relationship with her because of how destructive and kind of relentless they are. There's a, there's a comment about not wanting to wake up with like a magic mushroom infused hangover, and then later on you see exactly what the kind of things that they're the kind of drugs and party that they're doing and you can kind of understand like yeah that's that makes a lot of sense um but yeah rat queens is is absolutely hilarious like it's i'm only on the first trade and i'm gonna have to get the rest now because it was probably one of the the funniest things that i think i've read in quite a while and yeah so i definitely uh 100 recommend it i'm trying to think the the standout moments there's a, i believe there's a line where uh after kind of the big climactic battle at the end of the book that kind of sum, sums up the whole uh, attitude of the team as one of the team members says right we're going to have a party because i want to get drunk i want to get high and i want to have sex with orc dave who is like this burly orc man with a beard that has birds living in it and it's like that's pretty much sets up the whole tone of the thing uh, yeah so if you're you know not uh particularly of the faint of heart and uh, you're in the market for something to read rat queens is definitely something i'd recommend that sounds awesome it, it is, sound it, is really, it sounds really good yeah, it, it sounds is, like it something is. my girlfriend would love as well because I'm looking at images while we talk, and it, yeah. art style looks a bit like Saga. Yeah, it does have a bit of that. I don't. It's uh, I didn't even say who the creative team were on it actually, which is my bad. But in one moment, uh, so it's written by Curtis J. Weeb or Veeb. I'm not sure whether it's a W I E B E. Uh, and the art on the Weeb. first volume is um, Rock Up Church. Uh, is the name of the artist okay. um, but then it's also had some of the issues like in the later issues i've known have been drawn by your your friend well not friend uh your your boy stepan shejik is that the one yeah uh, i absolutely the artist, adore his work yeah uh, the guy who did uh, sunstone and a load of other stuff um but Death he did Fiddle. some of the later issues yeah those um yeah he's done some of those and yeah it's really good um it was one of those things where i looked at it and i just like from the the kind of the cover of the book, I thought it was probably going to be the kind of thing I would enjoy, but it's yeah the the characters are all really well fleshed out and realized, even for something that's pretty like they could just be one note characters. Like the the joke is that there's a the halfling thief who likes to to get drunk and party all the time. Um, there's the the atheist cleric who left her like family home because she's not sure she believes in their giant flying squid god. There's the the 
the wizard whose uh, catchphrase is "I've conjured a little f- you," <laughs> which, and then there's I think the the dwarf uh, fighter, which is her name is Violet, who uh, is the one who made the the joke about the comment about wanting to have sex with Orc Dave, who there's some kind of weird like backstory going on with her where like she has this whole thing with her brother and she'd abandoned her clan and she shaved her beard which is apparently like a big deal but yeah but if you're into to fantasy or action or comedy or like badass ladies killing goblins then rat queens volume one is a good place to start 100 percent sold that sounds fantastic definitely my favorite thing i've read in a while all right then uh so i think that about wraps it up for our first episode i hope you've enjoyed and thank you very much for listening if you want to get in touch with us uh you can always go to uh at brb on twitter uh or you can hit any of us up at our personal twitters and you can find me at i'm at uh Rubes cube r-e-u-b-s-c-u-b-e-s uh, you can find rick at i think it's at strange play rick <laughs> not <If> sure not. <laughs> no i don't use my personal one that often so i'm always on the strange play uk one well if, if you know either one if they want to get in touch if you search for strange play that will bring up uh, the name of rick's youtube channel which you can find which you should go see because his let's plays are good and uh, yeah well ryan where can people find you as well if they want to uh my handle is at the ryan goodman there we go uh yeah and that's been great and if you want to get in touch any queries comments come find us on twitter come find us on the forums at brb or tweet us like we said thank you very much for listening uh, i've been ruben i've been rick i've been ryan thanks for you very much for listening and goodbye Go. <laughs>